OK, so after drop is an important phenomenon. If you had someone who was close to a thermal stress point, after drop could take them over to the edge. But really, for most of the exposures in diving, think of that last case. It was such a trivial change until that person was well and truly out of the situation. It wasn't a life threat. But realize that after drop can be a hazard. And the reasons it happens, and I've got these prioritized in what I think are the most important ranking. Attenuated shivering thermogenesis is the biggest reason why you have after drop. You're not shivering, you're not producing the heat, so that's costing you. Number two, you have conductive heat loss along the thermal gradients. So the outside is cold, you have heat flow through the body, and that causes cooling. And then the least important is the one that a lot of people write about as the most important, and that is this idea of convective cooling because you have return in blood flow. When you are cold stressed, you are prolonging the risk window for decompression stress. In the deepest phase of the dive, when you're nice and warm, which again, everybody wants to be, you're getting maximal loading. Then towards the end of the dive, when you're cold, you, you vasoconstrict. So you're keeping that close to saturated tissue with lots of nitrogen. When you end the dive and you're cold, that loaded tissue stays loaded longer. There's actually a nice paper put out in 89 by Mekovic and Kakatsuba. They were doing a decompression study at Simon Fraser University, and they have a four-hour Benz watch. After the Benz watch, they were going to go up for beer. They all jumped in the showers, and three out of four of them developed skin bends. So it prolongs the risk window because you're not eliminating that gas. OK, if you get someone who's cold, realize that hypothermia doesn't even begin until you get down to 35 degrees C. And we've already talked about how you can rewarm people. Blankets work just fine. And if you have more extreme needs, you can go through it. This is the kind of case report you might see, though. So a 34-year-old male reported numbness and paresthesia in his left hand post-dive. He did a dive to 90 feet for 90-minute total run time, 6 degrees seawater, 43 degrees Fahrenheit if you prefer. He had a dry suit, a wrist computer, and trimix. So these symptoms were waxing and waning. The big question, is it DCS? 90 feet for 90 minutes. One of the big things you have to remember in that summary profile information he could have popped down to 90 feet for two minutes and then spent the rest of the time up at 30 feet. That's why we need computerized profiles. It doesn't do us any good just to know your max depth and your time. But here's the interesting part. When you wear a dry suit and you put a gauge on your wrist before you dive, what do you do with it? You reef it down because you know the thing is going to roll around as the suit compresses. We have someone who's creating a constriction on the left wrist the one with symptoms, this was a non-freezing cold injury. There are thermal issues that can occur in the diving world, but hypothermia is really not anywhere close to the top of the list. What do we have for thermal protection? We've got passive and active systems. And for the wetsuits, we know that standard foam neoprene is sensitive to pressure. You're going deeper, passing through thermoclines into colder water, and what's happening to the suit? It's getting less effective. At one atmosphere, you go down to four atmospheres, you can be losing two-thirds of the insulation value of that neoprene. And what's interesting, a lot of people are surprised by this, that neoprene is, is half the insulation value of air. You think, well, how can air be better than neoprene? Easy. Neoprene holds more heat capacity, so your conductive losses are much greater. Air, if you could have a nice air bladder there, doesn't hold as much heat, so your heat flux is, is actually moderate. There are a lot of things you have to think about. It's, it's a neat set of relationships. OK, how can we improve this? Well, some manufacturers have tried to develop neoprenes that are less sensitive to pressure changes. And that can work. Pinnacle had their elastoprene that theoretically was more stable. I will tell you right now, it's hard to get data on how the new suits perform. So many come out, and it's, it's hard to get data. So I don't have a lot of hard numbers for you. But there are some products out there that, that people consider. And this is, this is one of the aspects that is a concern. If you compress, you lose efficiency of that material. So it'd be nice if we had something that didn't compress quite as much. OK, dry suits. We know that dry suits rely on that layering technique. We've got the base layer, the mid layer, and the shell. The base layer is usually something like polypropylene. What does that do? What's the purpose of a base layer when you're going out into the woods? It wicks water away from the skin. It stops your ability to evaporate. By moving the water far enough away from the skin, even though you've got a heat engine on the skin that would evaporate that liquid, it's so far away, it's not quite enough to evaporate it. And so what you're doing is you're removing the liquid from the heat engine so there's no evaporation or reduced evaporation. OK, is that what happens in a dry suit as well? We already talked about it. What's the relative humidity in a dry suit? 100%. How much evaporation is there? Nada. 
So why do we do it? Because if you were a wicking layer that has, it's hydrophobic, it holds very little water volume, you have less conductive flow into that water volume. And so that's why you wear the wicking layer. It's for comfort. It has nothing to do with evaporation. Dry suits are also, if you're talking about the standard foam neoprene suit, it's also compressible. Shell suits, like the trilaminate or nylon, any number of shell suits, they're thermally stable because there's nothing to compress, but they also don't provide a lot of protection. 0.2 clo, that's less than that British summer weight suit. Okay, shell suits are thermally stable, but they're not giving you much in the way of protection. Now, another alternative is to go to crushed neoprene. It's produced under greater pressure, and so basically within the diving range, it's not suffering the compression of a normal foam neoprene suit, so it's fairly thermally stable. It also provides you about 0.6 clo in protection. So it's warmer than a shell suit, it's thermally stable, and when you add the undergarments under that, you do pretty well. Undergarments are key because the suit itself, while it gives you some protection, it's not perfect. What about the undergarments? There are numerous options, and we're not going to have the time to talk about them too much here, but the major variability is in the preservation of loft that I talked about before, and that is the take-home message. A lot of people were really excited about weasel wear. This uh, diver right here is actually clearing ice holes in the Antarctic wearing his weasel wear. On land, weasel wear is really good because it's such a high loft garment. It's great, but we already talked about it. When you put that dry suit in the water, what happens to the air envelope? it gets pushed up to the top. What happens to the weasel wear? It gets crushed. So weasel wear, and I'm not trying to pick on weasel wear, I, I, I'm using it as an example. But the, the undergarments that are very compressible are not giving you the same protection as something that would have a protected loft. Now let's look at some of the other materials that are out there, newer materials on the market, something like the halo system by Fourth Element. This is really kind of interesting. If you look at it, it's got pads. If you push sideways, they will collapse. But if you have a direct pressure on them, they will tend to stay upright. What those pads are doing is preserving that dead airspace rather than something like the weasel wear that is just compressing down to nothing. There are some other dry suits, and again, the UK is one of the more interesting ones. They have an under layer, that, and it makes a, a fixed airspace barrier because it's a very open waffle. It allows some fixed trapping of gas, which gives you pretty good insulation. So there are some strategies that take advantage of what we really understand or should understand about the thermal stress. Okay, Aerogel is another product that's coming out. So this is a new one, it's worth talking about. It's actually an old product. It was developed in the 30s for the aviation industry. It's incredibly light. 99.5% air, so it's rigid, it holds a nice airspace. It was an insulator, it's great. The problem is, you have to mate this stiff material with a clothing garment to make it work. The bat is fit with another undergarment, and what you can see in terms of protection, if we think about a th six millimeter thick suit, a wetsuit may give you about 0.75 clo, Finsulate may give you 1.25 clo, Aerogel could give you 2.8 clo. So it has the potential to be incredibly valuable. And we're going to come back to Aerogel, but just before we do, I want to add one last picture to the mix, and that is dry suit inflation gas. Everybody in this community is familiar with the people who use argon, argon pardon me, as an inflation gas. It has a lower thermal conductivity, and so it should theoretically improve insulation. Well, Risberg and Hope did a study, double-blind study, where they had people diving, and the researchers didn't know, the workers, the divers didn't know, and what they found is that using argon in the suit, it made no difference on skin temperature, core temperature, or perceived comfort. So after this came out, Lou Knuckles, who was the guy who originally proposed the, that it could give you about a 48% increase in thermal insulation, he went back to the lab with a mannequin, and what they found with argon, you could get a 16 to 20% improvement in your thermal protection which depending on your diving, that may or may not be significant. But there are a couple of kickers. The biggest one is that they had to flush and fill the suit at least six times to purge everything to get it ready. Trouble is, argon is so expensive, guys want to carry the argon bottle, but when they go to open it, they're just, that's it, I'm full. No, you know, that's not working. They had to flush and purge and fill at least six times to get the benefit. So that's one. And I'm going to say right now that the cost versus benefit question remains open, and now let me show you why. And we're putting together now the air gel in this. So this is a, a, the mannequin study that Lou put together. And um, so what do you have? This showed the 20% increase in insulation using argon versus air as a field glass, and this was with a commercial dry suit. 
And so the take home message, we can look at legs, arms, torso, or this is the total body minus head, hands, and feet. So basically the majority of the body. And what we're seeing is we can get about a 20% improvement in the insulation. So here's your clove value. We're going from about 0.93 to 1.12 clo. So you think, okay, great, 20% improvement. Well, okay, that's using the commercial undergarment. If we go to Aerogel, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing a 16% improvement. So you might say, okay, you know, if I'm doing a 24-hour dive, it's worth it to me if I can get a 10 or 15% improvement. And that's all well and good, but what's happening is people are missing some of the important stuff for the weeds. That 16 to 20% improvement, let's think about if you just changed from the standard undergarment to something like a new aerogel undergarment that would be more efficient. What you're looking at here is comparing a commercial suit with an aerogel suit, we're getting a 149% improvement in the insulation. An undergarment would be a much better way to go. And so this is if you're using the, uh, this is a trilaminate suit and it's using air. I've got another figure that shows argon inflation with a tri trilaminate suit. And basically 140% improvement in the insulation. And so for the people who want to debate back and forth whether or not argon is useful, I won't argue, but there are other strategies that actually will give you much more bang for your buck and you're not going to have to refill it all the time. Okay, in-suit electric heating. There are some systems out there that work. They're battery operated, operated. They're reasonably safe. I have a problem with the human nature of it. And that is that it has the potential for creating that hazard we talked about in the beginning of being warm cold. And I'll tell you why. The battery life only goes for so long. If you start it up in the early in the dive and then it dies towards the end, you just created the worst case scenario, warm cold. Now, if you have the ability to go for the delayed gratification program, you're good. You can start cool, and then at the end of your bottom phase, you can crank it up for your decompression. If you can do that, these systems can work adequately. But they have the ability for our human nature to get us in trouble. And okay, hot water suits, primarily limited to commercial operations. And you all know what a hot water suit is, so I don't have to explain that. But the interesting thing here is this gives us the same kind of hazard that we talked about before. You can increase the risk of DCS because you are warming the body early on. You're maximizing the absorption of uh, uptake of inert gas, pardon me. And then during the decompression phase, you may not be doing enough to help. So there was a great paper published in 86 by Shields and Lee, a report of North Sea diving. And they had far and away huge increases in DCS in the hot water suit divers. There's another problem, and that is undetected hypothermia. Remember we talked about it before. The way you know you're cold is your skin is cold. We're not designed, our bodies haven't caught up to our technology yet. So when the skin is warm, our brains say, you're warm. And so when you clamp the skin temperature warm, you don't shiver. You are insensitive to respiratory heat loss. And if it's a deep dive, you can cool, you can get what's called undetected hypothermia. And it was measured in a couple studies. If you have core temperature drop no more than about 0.7 degrees C per hour, you will not be aware of it while your temperature is dropping. So interesting possibility there. So what do we know in summary here? Well, first, there are just a, a couple things I want to take home. Thermal stress is set by the protection, not the water temperature. So we really have to get a, away from this idea of just because a computer knows what the temperature of the water is, it knows anything about my experience. And I believe it's a disservice to the community to let people labor under that false impression. There are no algorithms that compute thermal stress. And I know there'll be somebody who says, oh, ours does this. Well, guess what? It's a soft adjustment that arbitrarily makes a change. It's not monitoring your condition. There's not a computer out there that does it. And then number two, thermal stress can influence diving safety, primarily decompression related. Hypothermia is not a problem. Your first concern is the effect on your decompression safety. The second concern is a localized circulatory disruption, particularly with a dry suit when you've got those constricting wrist seals. And then the far distant third is hypothermia. Okay, thanks. Aerogel become commercially available? Well, aerogel suits, they're, they put a lot of money into suits. Right now, the test suits are, I think last I heard, they were two or three grand a piece. But it's going to come on the market probably um, within a number of months. Whether that's less than 12, I don't know. But it'll be out there very, very soon. First iteration will be pretty expensive, but it has the potential to be pretty neat. Got a question. Your Antarctic diver, 
When did the core temperature come back to the 36 degrees? The core temperature on that profile, it actually didn't come up until the next day. It was, uh, there was a prolonged depression of that core temperature after that uh, immersion under the ice. Well, yes, you can. You can exercise lightly on decompression, but that's what you want. Aggressive exercise would be counterproductive. You can do isometrics. You can do light swimming and a slightly negative um, buoyancy. What you should do is keep your workload as low as possible during the bottom phase.